Okay. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, thank you so much for being willing to be part of this conversation. My, uh, my hope, my prayer for this, this time is just for us. Well, if I may say it this way, uh, Jesus shared a parable of, of, um, of someone who got beaten up by robbers. And as, as people started to walk by, a Levite a priest, both of them just walked by without doing or thinking or saying anything. And a Samaritan, someone who is commonly not known to, to help people like the person that got um, beat up. The Samaritan, it says that the Samaritan had compassion and that's what led him to action, led him to bandaging the wounds and bringing him to a hotel and paying for their, his stay. And tonight is not so much about, you know, learning all the best content. It's not about hearing the world's greatest speaker, although Greg is fantastic. It's, it's less about content and more about compassion. It's more about just being willing to sit in the sadness and sit with uh, the struggles and hear uh, the story and hoping and praying and fighting to see the humanity that connects us all. And so that, that is the pretense that I would hope for us to approach this event. Um, and I'm going to be and seeing um, Pastor David is also going to be uh, chiming in and sharing. And our main guest of honor today is Greg Francis. And I hope that you guys can all give him a welcome. We are so grateful and happy to have him. I've um, been friends with him for years now and just watching him uh, just be a voice that, that needs to be heard um, the way that he uh, just articulates so clearly and concisely, not just in uh, social media, but also in person and just uh, his humble attitude and his willingness to approach the hard topics, I felt like was a great place to start for us in terms of just, just listening. And so with that in mind, um, yeah, I wanna welcome you guys or welcome Greg to you guys. And Greg, I would just love for you to share just a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do, who you are, how you know us. Um, if we could just start there. For sure. Can anybody, can everybody hear me? It's like a thumbs up if you can. That's great. Um, before I talk about me, because I'm not that interesting. So thanks Jesse, but no. <laughs> um, I do wanna say that I'm super grateful that I'm getting the opportunity just to speak to you guys tonight, whoever you might be, uh, wherever you might be from, um, if you're sitting on this call, the idea or the assumption is that you're at least willing to listen. Um, and right now in the world, to me um, and to people that look like me, that is the, that's the most valuable thing you can give right now, uh, is an ear to listen. Um, and I, I just want to, I want to preface everything that I say tonight with this idea. If you don't leave with any, anything else, leave with this. Um, a lot of what you'll hear me share tonight is not exclusive to my American experience because the truth of the matter is uh, we have a lot more in common than we don't. You know what I mean? And so a lot of what you'll, you'll hear my experience be about, um, I know that a lot of it will resonate with you uh, because at any time um, in almost any place in the world, anybody could feel, you know, less than or devalued or like they're... Um, being discriminated against. And so do know that the African American experience um, is an interesting one. It's a painful one. Um, but I know that it's not something that is exclusive to African Americans. So again, thank you for your ears tonight. And, and do, um, do be encouraged that there's a lot about my story that will probably line up a lot with, um, with many of yours. Um, but as far as I go, I'm telling you guys, I am really not that interesting. Like, um, I grew up in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. I am one of seven siblings, and many would argue that I am not the most interesting one. <laughs> I, um, I enjoy alone time and books, um, 
romantic movies that end with the guy getting the girl um just like ice cream like nothing <laughs> nothing really really special i think that uh what my friends would say is special about me is i wrote a book once um i wrote about the experience of the experiences of being a black man growing up in brooklyn and i used a little bit of, of what's true to my own story and added some fiction in there too so that it would be enjoyable to read um probably the most interesting thing about me is i have a two-year-old daughter named sarah and she's um literally the best thing that's ever happened to my life aside from my wife Livni, who's also something i don't deserve yeah so all of the interesting things about me are uh, they they surround the things that god's given me not so much uh what i've done in, in anything of my own you know might or merit or anything like that and so um i think i think that the reason why i'm on this call and the reason why i know great people like jesse um is because uh, i try and live my life uh, in a way that is more inclusive than it is exclusive and I believe that when you do that, you just meet really awesome people. So um, with that said, I really want to say it's really awesome to meet all of you guys, even if just virtually. It's really good to see your faces and or names and still shots. So <laughs> thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, appreciate that, Greg. That preface was really good, too. Mm -hmm. um, so like, let's just like get into it. Like, how are you feeling? Or I know that some people say it's insensitive, it's insensitive to ask, but just, man, like, what's going on how are you processing and what yeah. do you think out of this um it's a weird feeling um it's kind of like when you have a loved one pass away and um you go back to school and everyone knows about it and so there's a lot of hey i'm so sorry for your loss and the interesting thing is even even without being related to a george floyd I think the world recognizes that there is a relation because of the ways that he and I are similar, both being black men in America. Um, and so it kind of makes you feel like all the attention is on you. Um, but the flip side of that is um, for years, I'm only 30 years old and um, some might say that that's old or young, but from my perspective, there's a whole generation that's coming up underneath me and there are generations that have lived before me. And I know that a lot of men and women who look like me have had the same passions and have used their voice in the same way that I use it as it pertains to the race issue in America. And so right now, the entire world has affirmed and confirmed that the things that we've been saying, the cries that we've been crying are real and that we're not making it up and that we're not exaggerating. Um, and I have to say in a way that is not prideful, but in a way that is relieving, in a way that makes me feel human, uh, to see the world respond to something that's been so real for me for 30 years, um, it, it, for lack of a better term, it just feels good. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's obviously in spite of the sadness about, you know, what you see happen to a human being, in, you know, in spite of what he may have done yesterday, or not yesterday, excuse me, the day before what we saw, or even the year before, the truth is what we saw happen to him shouldn't happen to anyone, you know? Yeah. Um, Pastor David, I would love for you to weigh in too on just like, how are you processing it? Um, what do you see? So I remember when I first, when I first heard the news of what had, uh, taken place with, um, the the George Floyd situation. My first reaction was, thank God they had video. Mm -hmm. And I had I, I had already heard so much from my African American friends about having gone through a number of these situations. And one of the things I heard expressed uh, the most, I think, and the part that really sticks with me, is they said. And this was so different from my experience, watching the news and f seeing about crime or things like that. They said, when something like this happens, everyone says that could have been me or that could have been my brother or my son or my uncle or my fill in the blank. And if there was not video, I felt like this was not going to be any kind of, that this would not have been any kind of a story. It would just have been just like all the other stories I've seen in my life. But the, the thing that made me the most hopeful, that made me the most um, 
if there's, I think, really a, a happiness or a silver lining that has come from all of this, it's to see so many churches, uh, especially, so many Christians sort of wake up and say, you know what, this actually is an issue that really doesn't just matter in an ethereal way, but it matters to me. And this is something that I think God really cares about. And to see that kind of action, I think, is, um, has been an encouragement for me in the midst of this. And honestly, partly because um, I am not primarily functioning in the Black community, it's meant that I've also seen uh, a lot of the obligatory questioning come up. People mm -hmm. starting to ask, well, was, was George Floyd really a good person? Well, are the police really as biased as the media is saying? And of course, there are a million different viewpoints being expressed at this point. And um, I think there's a certain amount of grief for me there too, because yeah. I, I think the, num the number one thing that all Christians should be committed to before we talk about being committed to this or that political party is what is the truth? And and for us to selectively close our ears to the truth is always going to be bad, which is why uh, I really believe that listening is so important here. Yeah. And so to that end, like, man, Greg, what are the things that we just, as, as we just might not know as people who are not black and have not grown up black and maybe we've, we've seen things in history books, but we may not have known certain things. Uh, what are the things that like, what do you need to tell us that we should know as we approach this situation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's so many things, right, that I could say. And I think that the one thing that's kind of been resounding just in me is this idea that um, it is as bad as it looks. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for a very long time, the narrative has been, well, are Black people exaggerating about what the experience is to live in America? Or... Um, are there more facts to consider? Or uh, kind of like what you said, Pastor David, what did this person do to deserve this? And I think that when our brains, uh, especially as Christians, right? When our brains and our hearts are forced to process something like what we saw happen to George Floyd, I believe as a, as a defense mechanism or as a way of surviving, right? We, our brains do this thing where it tries to make sense of what we just witnessed. And so maybe in a way that is not intentionally, um, how can I say, maybe in a way that is not intentionally wrong, we try and make sense of evil things happening when really sometimes, and I would say for the African-American person, most of the times when these injustices happen to us, it is as bad as it looks. There are no other details that would justify the way that black bodies are handled in America. Um, and the way that you know that is simply replace the victim put yourself in those shoes. Or like you said, Pastor David, put your son or your daughter or your friend, heck, your dog in those shoes and immediately something rises up in you that goes, hey, that's wrong. Um, no matter what that person did, no matter what, no matter which way they may have lived their lives, no one deserves that. No one deserves what I'm seeing. And so I think that um, although it's manifesting as a race issue, again, I think the more deeply rooted issue is are we seeing each other as humans again? And so as you slowly begin to see people responding to this in what I would deem is an inappropriate way, a very human way, is to you, you not ask questions about what happened before and focus on what happened in the moment you saw a man's life leave his body on camera. Um, and, it's, and, and, and we're able to see it on the six o'clock news. We have become, we have so detached um, ourselves from humanity that we're able to watch a video like that and continue just eating dinner, deeming that he did something to deserve it, as opposed to saying no one deserves that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, to see those things on the air is, like, I hope that we never get numb to that, that yeah. we just kind of see it as, you know, sensate, I, I, I don't know, it blows my mind that um, because of the color of their skin that we would be more distanced from what's happening there. Sure. The, the injustice that's happening there. Well, uh, 
I would say this, Jesse, if I'm allowed. Um, I think that for a very long time, if you pick a people group, pick a culture, pick a race, society has taught us how to see that race. Um, how much sympathy and empathy we should apply, how much compassion we ought to have. Um, society teaches us how to teach, how to treat one another, um, almost as if the bar moves depending on who you're talking about. Um, when instead, um, I believe that so long as the person is human um, and that they have life, that we ought to advocate for them no matter what they look like. Um, because today, and, and many of the days before today, it's been a race issue that has been centered around the Black experience in America. But what happens when it's the Latino experience in America or the Asian American experience in America? What we, what we ought to decide is, hey, this is not right, no matter who we put, you know, who we put in the hot seat. And I think that the moment we begin to give in to the ways that society teaches us to look at one another as if we're that different, that is the moment where we, we uh, unknowingly contribute to this, this system, right, of just ideas that just exist that say, well, if it were a white body, then we'd make a little more noise and make some arrests a lot quicker, but it's just another black life. And even if that is not your perception and it's not your experience and you don't agree with it, you have to at least acknowledge that for a lot of people, it is their experience and it's what they live through. Mm. Yeah. So then I don't know if there's anything that you would be willing to share about like how you lived through it. What was your experience like, you know, you said in the past, in your 30 years of living, um, it paints and I'm sure it colors a lot of what you do and to, to not be able to access the same level of just like perceive we're all, we're all humans first. Um, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, I would say that it would, it, I, I think, I would assume that it, my experience um, would really mirror a lot of you guys' experience um, because all of us could probably point to a time where we felt, right, devalued. But for me specifically, um, I can remember the day that I, I finally passed my road test, got my license, and um, I'm excited to now drive. And um, my dad sits me down and, um, man, this is weird, I'm sorry. I wasn't expecting to get emotional. Uh, my dad sits me down and um, I knew that the talk he was about to give me was not like the talks we had had before. It would not be about how to jump a car battery or you know, how to jack up the car if you needed to change the tire. Um, he proceeded to give me instructions about if and when I would be pulled over by a police officer. Um, and I would like to think that I was the kind of kid that just really didn't get in trouble. I think I could find a few teachers <laughs> and after school directors that would say, yeah, Greg was a good kid. Um, I'd probably have to pay my mom, but either way I could get maybe five or six people that could say, you know, Greg didn't cause a lot of trouble. Um, but it was the first time in my life that it was made clear to me that, hey, it does not matter how good you are. It does not matter if you're on your best behavior. It does not matter how many times you followed the rules correctly. All that it takes maybe is one time that you don't. Um, because if and when you have this encounter, you won't get a chance to advocate for yourself. You won't get a chance to explain. Um, because as soon as that officer sees what you look like, he's already been taught how to treat you. And I won't say that that's all across the board because the truth is I've had some amazing encounters with law enforcement. Um, ones that you probably wouldn't believe. Um, you know, I've had, I've had encounters with police officers that were unfair in the good way. Like I've been let off of sometimes where I should have gotten a ticket or, you know, you know, I knew that I took that light or I knew that I didn't stop and wait three seconds at that stop sign. And so absolutely officer write that ticket and they did not And so I'm not saying um, that it's, it's something that swings just one way. I believe the pendulum swings both ways, depending on your experience. Um, and I've had a ton of them, but I know that the one that really just weighs on my heart was that initial experience because of what I know is that there is, there was a kid that was 18 as well at that time who had just passed his road test and his dad didn't have to give him a talk about how to conduct himself if and when he were uh, to be stopped. 
uh, you know, by a, a police officer. And what, what I know is this, it, it's one of those, it's like insurance. Maybe it won't happen, but just in case it does, I need you to have this. I need you to have this knowledge. I need you to have these set of instructions. Um, the hardest part about that talk was when my dad informed me at the end that, um, hey, there's still a chance, though. Even if you do all the things right on this traffic stop, there's still a chance that you won't come home. Be it because, you know, you were put in cuffs or, or some bullets were put into you. And, you know, I hate to put it that way, but we're seeing far more often than not that when, um, when Black men and women go into police custody, they don't always make it home. I do, I, I do want to do this, though, if it's okay. I do have a positive story about law enforcement. Yeah. Um, when I was about seven or eight, uh, my parents, they went out to run an errand. You don't have to shake your head yes to this because I know your parents did this, and it's okay. And they left me and my siblings at home alone. Um, again, parents do it. It doesn't make you a bad parent. Uh, my parents were awesome. And I'm not, I'm not just saying that because my mom might see this. My mom and dad were awesome. And... Uh, they just went on an errand the way parents do. And, you know, my older sister was in charge and she knew to call 911 if there was an emergency, all those things. Um, somehow, some way, uh, the police got wind that there were some kids home alone. Um, and they came and they got us. They took us down to the precinct. Um, and we would proceed to be put into foster care for two weeks. Um, and now I, I thank God every day that my mom did everything that she could. She went down to the court. She did all the right things to get us back because she was an awesome parent. Um, but what I'll never forget is those officers, they made sure we had something to eat and it was good food. They took a, I'll never forget, they took us to the corner store and we all got to pick out our own sandwiches and they made sure we had something to drink and they asked us what life was like at home. Now, when you look at what the world tells us about the way law enforcement and the African-American community interact with one another, that story does not make sense. Um, but uh, I, could call, I can call my siblings right now and they would they would attest to that story and they would say those police officers that day were a lot kinder to us than some family members had been. And so this is what I know. It's not a race issue, mm. humanity issue. Mm. Are you encountering others in a way that is humane? Are you realizing that the other person this, on the other side of this encounter is human? Is that registering to you? Are you, do you have the ability to take away your preconceived notions and say, I know what they told me to feel about you, but I'm willing to take the risk that you're better than what they said. Yeah. yeah. Race, race doesn't apply to that. That's a human thing to do. Mm. You know the story about the Good Samaritan. Um, you could interchange that story with any race. And the thing that always brings it home is the fact that that man acted like a human to another human. And I think that once we could get back to treating each other like, like, like fellow humans, when, when these evil things manifest in matters of race or class or gender, then we begin to see better interactions than what we've seen in the past. And so I want to reiterate that today, it's the black fight. But my hope is that when it's the Asian fight or the Latin fight or the pay gap <laughs> between gender fight, whatever the fight is, that we could learn to see each other as humans. Yeah. Hmm. Um. Pastor David, did you have anything else to add to that? I think one of the most common responses I'm seeing to this whole question, as soon as we start talking about things like uh, police brutality or the question or the, um, especially when we start saying, uh, talking about each of the individual cases, whether we're talking about, um, whether we're talking about George Floyd or, um, Freddie Gray or Amadou Diallo, if you, you know, I'm, I'm a little older than, than Greg. I, I remember those days. Mm -hmm. um, it, there are always going to be some people who are going to be quick to say, well, there are bad cops and there are good cops and don't evaluate all, uh, all cops on the basis of the bad ones. Mm -hmm. And at this, and that's, and that's, that is true that that is not uh, untrue. There are good cops and we don't want to lump everyone in together, but there are also questions of, am I, am I in danger 
of lumping people together? Am I in danger of saying, well, if this happened, this person must have deserved it? Sure. Do I cross? Do I then cross the street if I see uh, a group of African American teenagers on the same side of the sidewalk as I am? Mm -hmm. And we start to realize that um, we like to try to put people in the camp of either good or bad and mm -hmm. define it so strongly. Uh, to, to see the issue in, uh, you know, pardon the unintentional pun, in black and white. Yeah. But in reality, there there are, every time that these things come up, there is an element of, is it I, Lord? Do I have mm. that feeling in my heart? Am I the one who is, is seeing people um, as part of a group instead of as an individual? Yeah. And there's this... Um, and especially when once our culture starts getting involved, once the media starts talking to me, once my friends start talking to me, right. um, once I start looking at places to live and people start saying to me, oh, don't live there, that's a bad neighborhood. And mm -hmm. what they mean by that's a bad neighborhood is, well, mostly black people live there. And we, don't, and we just can't recognize that we are, um, the judgments that we're making are uh, real and powerful and just like Greg said, dehumanizing. So yeah. I think that bringing it back to our fundamental value is so is such a big deal, Greg. And I'm so glad that you've like sh been willing to share this with us. Oh, absolutely. I, I want to piggyback that thought by saying it can be any one of us. Um, it's so easy in our anger. I mean, just drive in New York, drive in New York City and watch how quickly your prejudice comes out. Whether it's the bike messenger, whether it's the driver next to you, it is so easy for us to go to those dangerous scripts um, that society has written for us. They're already in place, pick a script. And when our emotions get high and tensions rise, you'd be surprised at how quickly you go to those scripts. And sometimes we don't even realize those scripts were there. And uh, it could be against people that look just like us. And so no one's exempt. No one's exempt. It could be any one of us at the at the bad end of, you know, a very racy experience. And so, yeah, we absolutely need to be checking our, our own hearts and our own preconceived notions about like, how do I feel about these things? How do I feel about this person? And listen, do the hard work of getting out there and deciding whether or not it's true. We check this out. We in every other instance in the world. <laughs> It's okay to rate your experience, right? You eat at a bad restaurant, you're able to leave a review, right? You get a bad Uber trip, you're able to leave a review because the idea is we, are, we have the freedom to, to, to um, the Bible calls it judging fruit, right? And it's because there's this idea that because you, because you have a mind and you're a cognitive thinker and you're able to put thoughts together, you're able to share with others about what your experience was. And so my fear is that we, we find it easier to hold restaurants and car rides accountable more than we do humans. Mm. And <laughs> it's, it's funny when you put it in that context, but it's true. I mean, think about it this way. There are entire shows on sports networks where men sit on panels and they are paid to judge men and women on their athletic ability. Why do we not do the same for humanity? Why is it not okay to say, hey, that's not okay. Zero stars, <laughs> you know? And I, I wanna be careful that we're not talking about treating humans as if they're inanimate objects, right? Because we're humans. But what I'm trying to say is, how much more important is it that we hold men and women accountable when it comes to the human things, the, the words we use to describe one another, um, the physical ways that we interact with one another? Um, we, we can't forget that behind the frustration, behind the anger, behind the preconceived notion, behind what the movies and music told you to treat me, that there's an actual human with an entire life of experiences behind this face. Yeah. And I think that once we can get back to remembering that we're humans first, we can talk about race, we can talk about who you voted for, we can talk about what church you go to later. First things first, I acknowledge that you are human. Mm. Where does that come from? How do we how do we foster that more? How do we break off what you know the, any preconceived notions and just kind of like see the humanity in each other better? Yeah, 
what is I think we, holding uh, it? I think the first part is just uh, looking inward first and sitting and dealing with the prejudice that is inside of all of us. Yeah. If you think, if you think that you don't have one, then sit a little bit longer. Because <laughs> uh-huh. it's there. I have it. You have it. It's there. That's the first step, being honest about the fact that given the right moment in the right situation, my prejudice will show itself. How I think about people unfairly will come out. The second thing is we have to be honest about the things that are in place that aid those, uh, those perceptions, those unfair perceptions. And then the third thing is we have to be daring and willing to begin to tear them down. This, this Zoom call is an example of that third thing, right? The first thing is being honest about the fact that it's in there, right? The second thing is realizing that we have to actually do something. Like we, 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 if we're okay with the way things are, we're gonna, we're gonna keep measuring the years, the amount of years that go by by shootings, right? And then the third thing is being willing, being daring to say enough. And I think that's what we're witnessing happen around the world right now. In one unified voice, the world is saying enough. And I think that, um, you know, those emails that come in from the people you might have bought one thing from two months ago, they come in and they're like, hey, be the first to buy this thing. And you're like, no, thanks. And then you might see a friend with that very thing. You're like, where'd you get that? And they're like, I got it on sale. Didn't you get the email? Right. What I'm trying to get at is you want to get in on this deal now. Hmm. Get in on the conversations, get in on the actions now. Um, and listen, this is not a perfect world. There will be people who it's going to take a few weeks, months, and years to tear down what they have decided is their reality, what the world has told them is your reality. I'm talking like hard conversations with family members, hard conversations with spouses and bosses about what used to be okay, but now we're saying is not. And it wasn't okay before, but it's like this awakening has happened. And we're just saying, this is not okay. And I won't stand for it. And I won't make you stand for it. And I'm daring you to step out of what feels safe because we've been doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And those are three practical steps that I need to check myself to make sure that I'm accomplishing. And honestly, sometimes even just, well, we might not even recognize the the prejudices or like like you said, you know, we might... We may not seen ourselves until we like dig deep, you know? And so like, I, I kind of wanted to bring it a little closer to home for many of us who may have had a similar experience. What has your experience been like with Asian Americans mm. or Asians or Chinese or who I want to know like more intimately, just like, what has your experience been? Because I can tell you that the media events, a lot of things are pitting to put us against each other. Yeah. So I want to know what your experience of that has been like. Sure. Um, there's an embarrassing one and then there's a sad one. Which one do you want first? Both. <laughs> um, I'll do the embarrassing one at the end because I think it's pretty funny. Let's talk about the sad one and get it out of the way, right? Yeah. The sad truth is that many African Americans interact with Asian Americans uh, in very urban cities and, you know, in ghetto cities of America, um, where African American people are the consumers and Asian Americans are usually performing a service or performing or, or providing a good, um, to that community, right? You have, you know, Asian American cuisine that just pick a neighborhood in Brooklyn. You know what I mean? Um, uh, you have nail salons, you have the place where I go to buy, you know, stuff for my hair. I'm constantly interacting with Asian Americans. Um, Here's the the tricky part, right? Society has told me to be upset at you because you have more businesses in my neighborhood than I have. And society has taught Asian Americans that when you interact with me to watch me closely. Mm. When what we're not asking ourselves is, why is that the arrangement? Yeah. What bigger thing is happening that we've, we've submitted to this idea that the only way we should interact is, is in the arrangement that I'm receiving something from you and I'm also not even happy about it. How do we change that? 
and 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 I think that I'm seeing a lot of like head nodding because like many of you guys have been in those situations just on the other side, right? We there my interaction has been I'm either purchasing a good or service from an Asian American, and there's a little bit of animosity and resentment because the loan that you got to open this business I was denied because I wanted to open a barbershop in my neighborhood. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and so I'm not proud of that that truth. Um, but again, line up 10 other guys from surrounding neighborhoods in Brooklyn where I grew up and they'll tell you the same thing. Like, hey, we buy from those guys, but mostly because we have to. We wish it could be us. Um, but again, that is that is specifically my experience. Um, and a few others that I could probably, you know, get to advocate for that. Here's my hope though, you ready? This is the embarrassing story. <laughs> my hope for the way that the African-American community and the Asian-American community um, interact uh, would be similar to a day that I remember um, that Jesse remembers really well. I know Luke remembers it really well. I know he's on this call. And it was a day in, uh, in Long Island when, uh, when um, we, we were meeting with you guys for like church, right? It's just like a small group. We were like getting together to hang out. And you guys asked me and a bunch of other black and Hispanic dudes if we wanted to play basketball. And I can remember looking around like... <laughs> Are you crazy? Like, have you have you written your last will and testament? Like, we about to show you guys. Like, <laughs> and so we get on the court. We get on the court, and you would assume, right, that this would just be a no brainer. Um, I could do this with my eyes closed and a pair of ten pound concrete boots on. Yo, Jesse, you guys smoked us. Like, we couldn't get a basket. Like, it was like. Um, it was like a glitch in the racial matrix. Like, <laughs> it was, first of all, right, we were a little taller than you guys. Um, do you guys remember Space Jam? Like when the Looney Tunes played the Monstars? <laughs> like, yeah, this is easy, easy money. Like, uh, my, dude, we couldn't catch up. I can remember like leaning down, bending over on my knees, like trying to catch my breath because I'm like, why are they so fast? Like, what is happening right now? This does not make sense, right? Yeah, and, about Matthew? And listen, it was so bad. And you guys remember this. It was so bad. I twisted my ankle. Probably out of frustration that we just could not beat you guys, right? But here's what I love. Here's what I love. Aside from that just being a very funny, weird, racial experience, we had a good time. Mm -hmm. And that day was not about the color of our skin and who was better at basketball, okay? Not, <laughs> let's not get off track. But the fact that we played a game together, um, I believe like you guys even like carried me a little bit. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of humanity on that day. And we got back to the house and we ate a little more and I iced my ankle. And in spite of what society told us to treat each other like, we had a really, really good time that day. Yeah. Um, and if there was any, um, if there were any naysayers or any skeptical people that would say, well, that was just one experience. Me being on this call today is proof that it's more important that we were human to each other than that you were Asian American to me and that I was African American to you. Amen. Yeah. Let's go. If, if you don't mind, if I could um, follow that up just a little bit, I think one of the most common uh, defense mechanisms I hear whenever race comes up as a topic is people say, well, I personally don't have a problem with race. I, I you know, I don't really see color. Um, they, sort of, <laughs> they, they, they jump in with um, they, a, a little bit on, maybe without using as many words, uh, Dr. King's statement that he wanted the children to be judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. But they take that a step further and they question whether is racism in our country really as bad as it seems like it is? If you can have Asian Americans and African Americans together in the same basketball court, why, how, what is the difference? How, where is the, the place? And of course, there's, there's, um, there's the underlying assumption that racism is something that just exists in the, in the hearts and the conduct of individuals there. Mm -hmm. But how would you how would you address someone who would say that who would say well you know I don't have a problem with racism you know I treat all people the same. <laughs> um, I'm sorry I'm laughing because that argument 
has existed for so long and it's become a place of comfort for people to not deal with the ways that they may sometimes be prejudiced. Let me say two things. The first thing is you have to see color. In the same way you go to the ice cream shop and you see flavors, right? Because it's important to us. We are sensory beings. We know things feel good and things don't feel good. And so to say that you don't see color is to reject an entire thing about a person. Don't let me confuse you. That does not mean that that, that is the, uh, the precursor or the marker or the indicator uh, for how you should treat that person. It's, it's just to say, I cannot completely remove one very important thing about you. Imagine somebody comes up to you, right? Say you go and you want to go buy, buy a pair of gloves. And the cashier goes, I don't see hands. I'm not the kind of person. It's like, this is a whole part of a person. How do you not recognize that this comes with me? It's a part of me. It's built in. It comes stock, my skin, my skin color and your skin color. So this idea that, that you don't see color is problematic. And we have to get rid of that notion because skin color comes with the person. For whatever reason, God deemed it important. It's how we are built. That's the first thing that I'll say. The second thing that I'll say is, I think that a lot, a lot of people think that they're racist, but they're not. I think a lot more people are prejudiced. And let me, let me explain that, right? To be racist means that you subscribe or contribute to racism. And when you think about every ism that you've heard, what you can understand is that it is a system and a structure built to oppress a kind of person. Have I lost you guys yet? No? Okay. So an example would be classism. It is a system and a structure used to oppress people in a certain class. Sexism, right, is a system and a structure used to oppress a certain person that comes from a certain gender in the way that racism uh, is, a, is a system and a structure that is used to oppress a person depending on their race. Now, in order to oppress a person, you have to have some type of power. And a lot of people think that they have the power to be racist when really they're just prejudiced. Let me give you an example. Um, there was this girl in high school and her name will remain, remain nameless because she may see this video. And she and I did not come from the same ethnic background. And when it came time, we had been dating for a while and I was wondering about when we might meet each other's families and hang out at each other's houses. And she very, in a matter of fact way, made it very clear, hey, you could never come over to my house because you are black and my dad will never approve of this. At 14, 15, this doesn't make me sad or anything, it's just like, all right, I'm just gonna go back to school, maybe talk to someone else. But here's, here's the thing. Her dad, in that case, he was acting out of a prejudice because he wasn't oppressing me or keeping me from access to education or to a good job um, or, or binding me to a particular part of the neighborhood because that's what racism does. Does that make sense? And so a lot of people are not racist, they can't be. What they are is their prejudice. And so again, that brings us back to our very first point when we can deal with the prejudice inside of us then it's not so bad to see color, right? Because the moment I say, you know what? I get mad at Jesse sometimes, but I don't have a problem with the entire Asian American race, right? What that does is it takes the power out of what evil tries to put into a descriptive word, which is just the color of our skin. And so when you hear the word black and you hear the word Asian or you hear the word Indian or Puerto Rican, it kind of diffuses it. What's always so funny to me is when someone is trying to describe someone who's black and they whisper it like it's a curse word. And so they're like, hey, do you know Rob? And I'm like, no, I don't know Rob, where's he from? And they're like, you know, tall guy, plays basketball really good. No, nope, I don't know what you're talking about. You know he's black. And I'm like, you know black is just a color, right? It's, <laughs> it's not an explicit, t you can say it. Um, so I say that to say prejudice fuels ordinary things to make them evil when they're not mm. that's really good um okay so i just wanted to say that um we're gonna have just one more question for both david and greg and then we're gonna enter into a time of q a and so courtney's gonna share a link in the chat um if you want to submit any questions that you would like any of us to answer uh, there's a live poll and you can just ant submit any questions you want and whatever gets upvoted the most, we're gonna attack those questions first. So um, just be thinking of those things as we share, as I share our kind of like closing question of this time. Um, David, Greg, I wanna hear from both of you, like what is, you guys may have like 
alluded to this, but in summary, like what is like the one question that we should be asking ourselves when it comes to this issue? Yeah, David, do you want to go first? I've been talking a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when when I first when you first asked us this question, it gave me a massive splitting headache because I think the more time you spend asking questions about race and racism in America and the the Black American experience, it's just you just learn it's there are just so many more layers of complexity than you thought. Mm. And um, every time I think I know something about this topic, I find out even more stuff that is uh, it, it make, makes my eyes bug out and my my head explode a little bit. But I, I think when it really comes down to it, the very first question that we need to answer, mm -hmm. whether we are, um, whether we ourselves are white or Asian American or anything else, the, the first question is, and it was the question that, that God asked Cain in Genesis 4, 9. He said, where is your brother? And that, and Cain, of course, as very famously responds, how should I know? Am I my brother's keeper? Oh my God. And the first question that each one of us has to answer is, before we answer any questions of, is this person who was harmed a good person or a bad person, uh, before we have any conversations about constitutional rights or about how well was the law executed or any of these other things, the very first question we need to answer is, is this man my brother? Mm. And if the answer is yes, then I need to be, which it is, then, I, then we need to be aware that God may very well be asking me, where is your brother? Wow. And if I reply, that has nothing to do with me. Am I my brother's keeper? He may hold me accountable for his blood. Wow. And I may not even realize that I'm the one who's Cain in this situation mm -hmm. because I'm so blind to the relationship between me and this person I'm listening to. So... Ultimately, obviously, we can be asked a zillion different questions. And as a, you know, as a, a pastor, we, we get asked a, a million questions by a million people. And we have to decide what's the right answer if someone asks me this. Mm -hmm. But one of the, the first things that I think I had to confront when I started thinking about this issue and the billion political issues tied to it and all the whole complicated mess is the question of, do I have the right to ignore the voices of my black brothers and sisters? And, and my, I had to ask the question, does the truth really matter to me? Because if it does, I cannot close my ears. I must listen, Be specifically because you are my brother and you are made in the image of God and you are precious and you are special. So I think I would encourage anyone who has been uh, moved or touched by this discussion to do exactly that, to say, what is my relationship to this topic? Do I see the brother? Do I see my brother when I, when I, whenever a situation like this occurred? I say we end the Zoom. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Everybody leave. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that, that blew me away in a way that I didn't even think I needed to hear. Uh, because we hear that story or we read that story in Genesis and because they were biologically related, we think that's the only way it implies forgetting that God made man in his image, period. Um, so Pastor David, that was amazing. That just blew me away. You guys tune into a talk that I might be invited to again somewhere else and I use that. I need no one to mention that I think it's at a first. Um, I'm fully taking that from you. Um, <laughs> But uh, Jesse, if I could answer that question, um, I would I would ask uh, I would ask this of everyone on this Zoom because I've asked this of myself. When issues like this become hot topics, they become to they start to trend. Um, that is another way you can search yourself and decide whether or not you've got prejudice. Because what when something is wrong, we decide right away whether or not we want to do something or say something. And oftentimes, once we're able to convince ourselves that someone is not as important, then we don't do anything, right? Again, back to that, the story of the, the Good Samaritan. And so what I would say is if everyone could leave this, this Zoom call and at any time in your life, hopefully tonight, just think to yourself, am I brave enough to do, say, write a song, sketch a sketch, film a short film about what's happening right now? Would I do it? Um, because 
all of us have our ways that we can contribute to what is the unified voice that is saying enough. And um, I would say search your heart and think about what you could do to contribute to that voice. And if there is a reservation, if there's a pause, if even for a second, I would say that's indication of some sort of prejudice. And my, my favor, my ask of you would be deal with that. Maybe you sit this instance out because you first need to deal with the parts of you and the parts of what has been passed down to you that say you don't need to speak up for everyone. I, I can say, not pridefully, but because I've done a little bit of work inside of myself, I can say that if what happened to George Floyd happened to any kind of a person, I'd be just as upset. And my, my voice would be just as loud um, because again, it's a human thing, right? But the moment we stop, once we read a little bit more about the story and we learn more about the victim, it says a lot about what's going on inside. For a lot of us, it's, it's just what we call culture, right? Culture taught us how to treat other people based on what they look like. Um, and I guess in short, what I would just ask is challenge that. Don't be afraid to go there. Don't be afraid to call up an aunt or an uncle or a brother and say, hey, do you have any idea why we do this? Can I share a very quick, very funny story? Yeah. As I mentioned before, I'm one of seven siblings, right? One of seven siblings. And my mom was a stay-at-home mom for a little bit. And so as you can imagine, we would drive her crazy, like just absolutely nuts. And the one thing she knew that we loved was cake. We loved when my mom baked cake. It was the best time in the world, right? Because you get to mix all the ingredients and you get to lick the batter spoon and then you're by the oven looking through that light to see like, is it done yet? And then when it's done, you get to frost it, right? And so my mom would always tell us, you know, don't make too much noise when the cake is baking because then it won't rise. And so we knew like, okay, <laughs> the cake's in the oven. Nobody make noise. Nobody say anything. And so you fast forward, you know, a couple years later, more than a couple, I meet my wife. And at this time, she's my girlfriend. And I'm over at her house. And you know that part of the dating phase where you're showing off what you can do really well? I'm like, yo, I bake the best cakes. Mm -hmm. So she's like, okay, like, cool, come over. We'll hang out with my family. We'll bake a cake together. So I'm doing what I saw my mom do, right? Put all the ingredients in, mix it. We lick the batter spoon. We put the cake in the oven, right? And then I go, okay, babe, we got to go in the living room or something because if we make too much noise, this cake ain't going to rise. <laughs> and she's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, Oh, yeah, you know, like when you're baking a cake, if there's too many people making too many noise, oh, my mom tricked us. <laughs> a way of getting seven kids to be quiet for 30 minutes so she could take a nap. And so I call my brother right away and I go, hey, man, do you know why you have to be quiet when you put a cake in the oven? Is it because it won't rise? And he's like, that's what mom said. And I literally had to call around to learn if what I learned growing up was actually true. And so many people that didn't grow up in my house were like, dude, that's not a thing. Like, <laughs> no one else does that. It's just your family. And so I tell that funny story tonight to, to encourage you guys. There are things that we do just because we grew up doing it. And if you could have enough conversations with people who didn't grow up in your house, you may come to learn that, hey, man, nobody else is okay with that. Like, that's actually, no one does that. And so the cake story is funny, but I promise you, man, like, I've had more interactions with people that don't look like me that were good than were bad. But it took me actually being all right with the embarrassing fact that, like, man, the way I grew up was not the same for everybody. And that's okay. It's okay if you got to call up your mom and say, you told me that when I run into a black person, he'll be really good at basketball. I am proof that that's not true. So, <laughs> you know, and that's a more funny example, but maybe you got to have a tougher conversation, you know? So I just want to encourage you guys that tonight, get outside of how you grew up and take some risks, take some chances on people. We take risks every day. Why not on another human? Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Greg, for sharing that. Um, all right, well, right now, what I want us to do is kind of transition to this time of just like thinking and pondering on questions that we can answer together here in this room. Um, so if once again, if you can click on that Zoom link, um, input your question, we would and upvote whatever ones that you definitely want to hear, uh, we would love to start answering those questions. And um, Kind of like as we, uh, 
as we enter. And I'll wait for like a minute to, to kind of share uh, for you guys to, to write the questions. But I just also wanted to mention and just kind of like allude to like getting those prejudices out of our hearts may sometimes require us to approach this place of like, but I've been hurt by someone who was black before. I've been affected by, you know, I've been, I've been attacked by someone who is black. I've been hurt. I, my family's been like my, my family was a victim to, well, the LA riots in 1992. Many of our, my aunts and uncles, they owned liquor stores. And it's quite frankly, like the, the looting and the, the attacking that happened, you know, there's so many other things involved, but like, when I think back to the times when my mom said, Jesse, whatever you do, don't date a black girl. Like, I just kind of had it ingrained in me and I never thought to think about what, what, has, what could possibly happen for that to occur, for, for my mom to say something like that. And just exploring those, those avenues with her led me down this path of like, oh, the 92 riots, oh, like our lives were in danger. And it does not, you know, us, us like being willing to say, uh, you know, to support Black Lives Matter, it obviously doesn't mean that I just supposed to forget about our history, but at the same time, just doing that deep work within us to see, have I, it, at the end of the day, is this person my brother? Um, can we can we work towards unity together? Um, and so with that, I'm going to be um, sharing the screen, and hopefully, you guys have voted, upvoted. Um, we can kind of get to uh, moving to the Q and A. Uh, did Greg drop out? Oh, Greg, you back? You back? All right, Greg, you see? Hey, sorry. It's raining here uh, where I'm at Queens, and so the Wi-Fi is going in and out, so my regular phone now. So you guys can hear me, we're all good. Okay. All right. Um, well, we have some questions here, and I would love for us to kind of address them together. You ready, Greg? Yep, I'm ready. Uh, and just for confirmation, Jesse, am I all good? Is there any lag or anything like that? Uh, you sound okay. You sound okay. okay. Now, but if you start to get laggy, uh, turning off video helps. Gotcha. All right. So uh, the top, top one is, as a black Christian man in America, where there's so much injustice specifically towards you and the black community at large, how or has it impacted your view of God as the God of justice? Man, that's a question, all right. Oof, man, that's, that's heavy. Um, I can be honest and say there, are, there were some days where my anger was in full force against God um, because it does something to the human psyche when you're constantly seeing people like you being treated in a way um, that is unfair, um, that often leads to death right? Like, I just got into running. And it's like a month into running, the whole Ahmaud Arbery thing happens. And so I'm just like, should I go out and jog? It, you know, it was enough that my wife and I had to have a conversation. And so I remember that was the last time I got angry at God in a way that says, God, can I, I can't even run. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, as a Christian, it, it may makes you angry, um, but those moments are quickly hushed when I look at the ways that God has treated the downcast and the counted out and that he rescues them and he advocates for them. He does. So what, what that says to me is, Greg, it won't be forever. Mm. It won't be forever and there's hope for you. And I don't know, I don't know how people do without God, if I'm being honest with you. And so on my worst days, it's it's my my faith is shaky on better days i know that they're better because i'm remembering to turn to god 
and relying on the, the, the fact that he made me this way and that it was on purpose. And that when he looked at the way he made me, he said, that's good and that's my image. And so I have to remember that the way the world sees me should never trump the way God sees me. But again, that's just on the, that's on my better days. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. David, is, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I think one of the most precious things to me in all of scripture is the idea of the judgment. And I think one of the things that makes that especially comforting to me is because so, so few, so many things in this world that go wrong never seem to receive a punishment right away. There are so mm. many things that we wait for and we say, man, God, why are you taking so long? And, um, especially, you know, being from a, from a Jewish background myself, we're, we're very aware of the, how, how possible it is to suffer all kinds of injustices in a historical sense. And, um, if, if God is not going to hold everyone accountable at the end, then this world is a horrible, brutal, unfair, uh, nonsensical place. And right. that's where we try to live in it. But if, if, if God really is keeping score, and if we really can count on at the end, the fact that he will put all things right, yeah. then we can face tomorrow saying the even if no other human sees what I am enduring, God sees and he knows and he remembers and he has my tears in a bottle. And yeah. That makes it, uh, that I have to say that does affect um, the way I see God personally, that he is a God that experiences and cares about suffering. Amen. And he proves it at the cross. Yeah. All right. Ready for the next one. How are you preparing your daughter for the difficulties of being black in America? Uh, so uh, right now, can you guys hear me well still? Yes. Yeah. So right now, my daughter thinks that I'm Maui from Moana. Um, that's, just, that's just to give you a picture of her understanding of the world around her right now. Now the truth is she's super intelligent, right? Uh, a few weeks ago, um, we tried to take my daughter to the park and the park was closed and she could not understand why today she couldn't go to the park like every other day. And so what her cousins, her older cousins explained to her, right? She's two. They said, hey, the police closed the park because, you know, right now it's not safe to go to the park, right? You know, this is right after quarantine was lifted a little bit, but it still wasn't safe to play on playgrounds. What my daughter takes from that is the police are bad. Hmm. And the way that I noticed, know this is because just yesterday, and this is weeks after the park incident, she goes, daddy, the police are mean. Mm. And I go, baby, no, where did you get that from? The police are not mean. And now I'm looking at it through what's happening on the news, the lens of what's happening on the news, forgetting that even at the ripe age of two, she's already having these ideas about who law enforcement is. And so to answer your question, what I'm doing to prepare her for like what happens in the injustices that happen in the world is I'm trying to shape the, her experiences or I'm trying to stay out of her experience. Does that make sense? I'm trying to maybe add a little context to what she experienced or, or add some information to what she experienced, but not force her to see things my way. Um, and not to put my thoughts on her thoughts because the, the truth is in her small experience, the police close the park and they are mean. But what I have to do, right, even at, at two, I have to begin a conversation with her that says, sweetie, you can't say that the police are mean because of your one interaction <laughs> with not even an officer, but just what, you know, what was rightfully decided about the parks, right? Which was that, hey, they're closed right now because of bacteria and we don't want you to get sick. And so I'm being careful to, to monitor her script but not altering her experience. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Pastor David, you too have a daughter. I do. She's a little over a year old. Um, have you thought about this kind of question? I have thought about it somewhat. Obviously, she will never have the experience of growing up Black in America. 
But one of the interesting little quirks of my daughter's life is that she will go through her whole life being biracial. Uh, for those of you who know me, you know that my wife is Chinese. And that means that my, my daughter will have the interesting experience of being between. She is between cultures, she is between races, she is between American experiences. And, um, and at the same time, she will, she will receive certain things that um, pretty much for free that I don't think that um, Greg's daughter can take for granted as easily as my little Miriam can. Um, but at the same time, I think one of the really important things to learn is that race is an uh, aspect of who you are, and it's something that has to be known and acknowledged and recognized. And it's if you yourself don't choose to acknowledge it, other people will choose to, will choose to acknowledge it for you. Um, I mean, there have been like scientific studies that show that like race isn't a thing that really exists scientifically. It's something that people like construct and, and recognize it culturally. But at the same time, all the time, people immediately make snap decisions about you based on how you are, how you appear. And I think that is something that I want my, um, my little girl to be aware of, is when people see you, who will they assume that you are until you prove uh, to them otherwise? And I think that's something every, every father ought to make his uh, children aware of. Yeah. All right, next one. <laughs> Tupac or Biggie? Greg, you got, a, you got an opinion? Are we with Greg? Oof. Greg? I like Tupac. Oh man, we lost him. It's okay. Um, well, Pastor David, we can continue on with the next question. Do you still have faith in our justice system? Oh boy, oh, that's a messy one. Um, last year, I'm 37 years old. Last, time, last year, I was called for the first time to do jury duty. And I had my first experience with seeing how people acted who didn't want to be there. And I heard all of the stories that people told to try to get off having to serve. And I went up to the, when they, when they called me to interview me, I said, I'm a pastor. I believe in a God of justice. I believe it's important for people to um, make, make good, fair, uh, just decisions, and I, I want to serve on this jury. And I was not picked by the, uh, by the attorneys involved to uh, testify. And I would have to defer to my attorney friends as to why that might have been the case. But one of the things I think I learned was that I, I think for a, a lot of folks like me who grew up in so, sort of with the white American experience, we have really, to be honest, blind faith in our justice, justice system. And um, I think that I've learned since then that that experience is a lot more um, nuanced. And that, the, that when you start having to ask, answer questions like, don't tell me about justice, tell me whether they, whether the, what, what the law has to say about this situation, I think there is something fundamentally wrong with our justice system being based around laws and not around justice. Oh, absolutely. Is it okay for me to piggyback that? Yeah, please do. We're, I, we're, yeah, really. yeah. I, I think that I think that um, the the law, right? These things are written to help, to aid in our efforts uh, to be humane, to be human to one another. But when we rely on a law that we created for whatever instance in a particular time, when that trumps the mere fact that we're humans, that's when it becomes dangerous, right? It used to be against the law for women to vote or for black people to run away when they were slaves. That those laws obviously don't make sense in our society. And so if we're not careful, we subject ourselves to the law more than we do humanity. 
You see that all throughout the Bible, right? The disciples are picking from a field to eat on the Sabbath. And what do the Pharisees say? Look, this guy can't be Jesus. His followers are working on the Sabbath. And Jesus' response is, would, would you rather than starve? This idea is we can't serve a law more than we serve people. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. I do, I, I do want to answer something very, like a, a very important thing too. Um, growing up in Brooklyn says that I would have had to vote Biggie on that last question. But <laughs> as, I, um, as I get older and I listen to, I listen less to what the whole East Coast, West Coast hip hop war told me, which is that I have to go with Biggie because I'm from the East Coast. Uh, I kind of like Tupac's message a little better when he started reading books. He, he was making a little more sense than Biggie. So um, if anybody says that in public, I'll deny it, but I'm going to go with Tupac right now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, I don't have a... What I do want to add, though, is if we didn't have our justice system, we would be in enormous trouble. Yeah. We would be back to the days of the Wild West, we would be dealing with, um, we would we would be dealing with every man being a law unto himself. Yeah. And um, and we wouldn't have. And if you look at how we have public shaming of individuals now, I can promise you. Oh that my without, goodness. Without the justice system that we have, we would absolutely have lynch mobs. If we yeah. stopped, if we stopped having um, a real justice system. So let me just say that, that that even though I recognize the justice system is flawed, we absolutely need it because the alternative oh, yeah. is so much worse. Mm -hmm. Listen, we would not be able to clean the guillotine fast enough if, if, we, were, if we were left to our own vices. The, the, but the truth is, what you're talking about is right. We do need to restructure um, what has been put in place because the idea is that like, lawmen are not bad. The way that lawmen have been acting is bad. And I'd like to go back to a point that I said before, in every other sense, we're able to rate our experience. Why not with the people who handle black bodies and white bodies and Asian bodies and Hispanic bodies, right? Like we can't let this idea that we critique our experience stop at just entertainment things. When it comes to the, the human way we deal with each other, why are we not able to say, hey, flag on the play, that's not right. And so I agree with you, man. Like, listen, let me tell you something. If something went down in my house right now, if a guy broke in and tried to do something, the first thing I'm doing is calling 911. Do not be mistaken, because the truth is, I know that there's a system in place that was designed so that it might protect me if I were in danger. Is it perfect? No. Is it necessary? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, we got a couple more questions and then we're going to call it a night, but yeah. um, this one's interesting. Can you describe intersectionality? And as a black Christian man, do you believe that there are racist structures within the American evangelical church that must be dealt with? This person's been seeing this question amongst Christian circles on social media. Wow. This person is trying to ruin my night. That's a big, that's a heavy question. Um, I want to be mindful that my experience is just my, my experience. So let me say that. Uh, I'm trying to find the right way to say this. We, we can't ignore the things, that, the things about us that make us special. I think a lot of us, a lot of us would agree. Um, there, are, there have been ways, there have been times and instances that I've seen um, prejudice take form in the Christian church, in the Christian American church. Um, but what I would say is that it didn't begin in the church. I think that it just mirrored what happens outside of the church. Um, and so an example of that would be if we know that someone's really good at dodgeball, we're going to pick that person if we're team captain, right? Because they're good at dodgeball. The way that I've seen this in church is if we know that someone can really sing, we're going to pick that person to lead worship because they can really sing, right? The problem is when we begin to treat a person by what they can do and not who they are. Does that make sense? Come on. So, so I just want to make sure I'm, I'm treading carefully because I don't want to offend anyone. 
um, because the idea is that church has church was a place where my my purpose was identified. It's where I met my wife. It's where I really experienced the fullness of what it means to be like a son of God. And so I could never be mad at my church experience. However, I cannot ignore that when you talk about this idea of intersectionality, you would have, you would assume that the one place that that's able to be realized in its healthiest form would be in the church. However, what we don't talk about is the unhealthy ways that our prejudice and our um, preconceived, negative preconceived notions follow us into the church. And so we have to be really, really careful because, again, this is not just a Black American issue in the church. This is anytime you get a group of people together, we will begin to give hierarchy or, or give special privileges to people who have certain advantages because of the color of their skin. Or you, you get these things like diversity hires. Like, I hate that that's even a term. Um, but if we're being honest on the call, right, it's a reality, especially as we see it in the American church. And so that's why what you're having, what, what, what the person who asked this question, what they're seeing right now is a lot of Black voices that were silenced in churches before are being elevated. And while that may seem like compassion, um, it can sometimes come across as, hey, this issue is really hot right now. Where's our Black person? Right? Mm -hmm. um, does that answer the question though? Like, because that's been my experience. Um, you know, I've been given great opportunity. I will say that people have seen me from more than just my skin color, but in the same, in, uh, on the other side of the coin, I think I've, I've definitely experienced some moments where I've looked around the table and I've realized I'm here because I'm black. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, do you mind if I take that question a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm an alumnus of Nyack College and Nyack College as a, as a Christian school um, has its, has certainly has flaws, but has always had a real powerful relationship with God. And it's always as an institution been very much about diversity and how mm. I saw that play out uh, between the years that I finished my bachelor's degree and the, the time that I finished my graduate degree is that um, in that time, Nyack College hired an African-American campus chaplain. And what happened was over the course of a couple of years, the, the worship teams began to change and they began to incorporate more African-American people and more African-American styles of music and more aspects of African-American church culture Mm. And what I perceived during that time is that the, the white members of the student body had a real noticeable shift in their ability to interact with what was going on in the service, in their, uh, the sense in which they were able to, if you ask them, meet with God. But what was, but what was going on was there was so much, there was so much, there was a unspoken um, sentiment, I think, among the student body that said, there is a right way to do church. There is a way that I am familiar with, I am comfortable with, and that is the way that things should be done. And I began, and as things began to um, become more difficult on campus, there was so much finger pointing going on here at the, the, the change in the church culture. And I think that if you say, does the church have racist structures? And we can start talking about like polities and the way that churches are run and economics and all that stuff. And, and for denominations and things like that, those things certainly do exist. But for, even for those of us who don't have to worry about those things, the biggest um, threat for us is the fact that we tend to assume that our ways of doing things are the most, are the best ways of doing things, that the other ways are less familiar and therefore less good than our ways. And I will say this, isn't it interesting that as the, as the worldwide churches in Latin America and um, uh, African countries and uh, East Asia, as these churches become more prominent in global Christianity, isn't it interesting that all of those places still look to white America for leadership and prophetic voices and ideas? Um, isn't it interesting that a Nigerian singer sings um, 
gosh, what's the name of that really amazing song? Waymaker. Waymaker. And every church I know of in America sings the versions that were sung by white American bands. It is, um, it may not be something that you'd say, well, that's institutional racism, but we should be asking ourselves, what does this mean for me? That's, I think that's, that's an important question. Hmm. Oh, all right. Um, I think I'm going to call it. Uh, this one last comment, though, is, remains on the top. It says, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say that I really appreciate the dialogue going on here. Thank you all for this uh, encouraging discussion. Um, that's great to hear. And I honestly have just been moved and blessed and just, you know, just hearing your story, hearing, uh, learning from you, Greg, has been a real honor. And we're grateful to elevate your voice um, because we need to hear it. And I was very, uh, I was kind of scared at first to, to think about asking um, to have an event like this. Like I was getting the jitters all day because I knew uh, how, how touchy this is. But I'm just so grateful that Pastor David, Greg, everyone that's here on this call is just willing to listen, to willing to have that conversation, because I think that's the start of compassion. And that's the start of, of moving forward and seeing each other as people. And so um, I wanted to just end with prayer. Um, and I wanted to uh, just ask Greg to pray uh, and Pastor David to pray to close, and then uh, we'll be done. So, Greg, can you uh, pray for us to close the night and then Pastor David? Yeah, absolutely. And again, thank you guys for having me. Um, God, thank you so much that in a world that is probably fearful right now, reluctant, confused, a, a ton of emotions, I'm so grateful, God, that you would make us a part of the remnant of people who would say, we got this. We can do this. We have God. We will get through this together. Thank you, Lord. Um, that way before George Floyd and any other injustice, God, your son took on the biggest injustice so that all of us might have access to grace mm -hmm. uh, and love and a life that we could not imagine or get on our own. And mm -hmm. so, God, we're grateful tonight that we do have a hope and that it does get better in spite of the state of the world today. God, I'm grateful that uh, something that people will probably laugh at um, turned out to be amazing tonight, God, that people who don't come from the same background, who don't share the same experiences, were able to sit and listen and talk and learn and love on one another in a way that the world will call crazy right now. God, we're so grateful that you see us, each of us, that you love us, God, and that you care about everything that's happening in our hearts and in our minds right now. God, give us the boldness to tackle on those preconceived notions and those prejudiced ways that we might handle one another with. And God, that you would give us um, the grace to deal with ourselves as well, that we would not, that we would not handle ourselves um, any worse than you would. We know that you look at us with love and with kindness in God. And so allow us to not only treat each other with that, but as we learn more about what's happening on the inside, that we would give ourselves uh, that same allowance as well. And we pray all these things in your name, Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, we ask that you would help us to respond well to these words that we've heard tonight. And that the, the, the words that you have spoken to us, now that you know these things, but blessed are you if you do them, that those words mm -hmm. would, would, would resonate in our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you would begin to challenge in us the, the ways in which we need to change. Would you begin to show us, Lord, if there's any uh, unclean system of thoughts in us, would, and in those moments, Lord, where we're tempted to cross the street, where we're tempted to look the other way, where we, where we have that, that temptation and that idea that we would want to act in prejudice, we ask, Lord, that in those moments, you remind us um, to see that person as being made in your image and sincerely and deeply loved. Father, we ask that you would help us to be... Um, 
uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And that as we uh, navigate the, these really turbulent waters in this time, would you help us, Lord, to look past all of the, the many, many words that are being exchanged? And would you help us, Lord, to see that the value of the human lives that are at stake? Father, we yeah. ask that you would be with us. We ask that we, you would connect our hearts with your love. And that, and that once we understand the love that you have for us, would we then, Lord, be able to understand how it is that you love um, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. So, yeah. Father, we ask that you would uh, be with us and that you would reveal to yourself to us more and more. And especially as we come to, to recognize uh, our brother in each person that we meet. We bless your work in us tonight. And Lord, um, in as much as our minds can't accept what it is that you're speaking, we ask, Lord, that you would transform us and change our hearts. We bless you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, if you guys want to give love to Greg, um, I invite you guys to write in the chat, give clap emojis on Zoom, anything to show your appreciation. Thank you, Greg, so much for, for being a part of this conversation. And Absolutely, uh, man. It was an honor. Yeah. Um, Courtney put information on how to connect with Greg on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, if you want to keep up with us on Blueprint, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, but we're just grateful to, man, to just just talk again. I miss you, man. And I'm just grateful to, to, to speak with you again. And um, hope to see you soon. And Sarah and Libney, send them our love. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Love you guys. Thanks for having me tonight. Yeah.